could not think of a better introduction to this talk in terms of the background that Christopher Zinn in particular gave in terms of consumerism and also obviously in the context of emotional distress and mental disorder that Samantha so eloquently uh, highlighted. So I suppose in this talk as I see it, I'm aiming to bring these topic areas um, together. First slide please. I think we're all aware that many young people in our community are assailed by completely unattainable notions of what some people might believe is beautiful. Um, next slide, please. But clearly, uh, I think for most adolescents, these are completely unattainable um, images. Um, no young person is going to be looking like this, whether they want to or not, in a way that will be healthy for them. The challenge is even greater in the context of body image when we know that uh, so many of our young people are as overweight and indeed obese as these four young people on the left. And perhaps it's no surprise that in the context of all of this, we also experience increasing numbers of young people uh, at earlier ages who are experiencing um, more profound types of disordered eating. And the problem here is that each of these issues is very significant within their own right, whether we're talking about depression, body image dissatisfaction, obesity, eating disorders. And they are linked in complex ways. Certainly we know that a starting point is that the majority of girls, two thirds, would like to be at a lesser weight than their current weight. A more interesting balance for boys, a third who would like to be slimmer, a third who would like to be weighing more, particularly not in terms of weight per se, but in terms of muscular bulking up. And yet, as I've alluded to with these slides, we know that uh, a quarter now, but projected very soon, to a third are going to be over their healthiest weight. And I suppose the question as a community for us, whether we are in schools or the broader community or in health professionals, is how do we support environments that are recognising this complex world that young people are maturing in? And the complexity here is that we know that energy is widely available and for all of the reasons that Christopher so beautifully outlined, that the time available for physical activity is decreasingly available. The notion of people who are overweight being overweight because they are choosing to live unhealthy lives is a complete nonsense when they are overwhelmingly assailed, if you like, by social determinants of health that make unhealthy options the easiest choices for young people. This is not about judgment or blame. But I think in that context, it's important that we think about what is normal eating. The, con the context of normal eating in adolescence is very different to normal eating in younger children. There is increased independence from family, greater wealth with greater opportunities then for young people themselves to be making independent food choices outside their parental control. The content of meals across adolescence also greatly changes, not just in terms of what we know about skipping breakfast and having uh, skipping meals and uh, having more snacks, but a much higher energy content, which on one hand is appropriate in terms of the early adolescent growth spurts. Young people do need a lot of energy for that, but many young people these days are getting way above their normal uh, or recommended daily intakes. So what are eating disorders? They don't arise out of the blue and they don't come from Mars. They are on a spectrum from normal eating through to dieting, through to subclinical disorders and then diagnosable clinical conditions. And it's interesting to think when we look at on the left here that notion of what's normal eating, when we appreciate how few young people commonly experience uh, hunger and how hard it is for young people to recognise body, if you like, experiences of hunger versus satiety or feeling full. But it's actually really important that young people have such experiences. 
Dieting arguably is becoming simply normal, but the ways that adolescent diet, adolescents diet are typically very unhealthy and certainly aren't effective in terms of losing weight for the majority of those, and 60% of girls and about 40% of boys suggest they are on a diet at any one stage. So this notion that young people have typically of wanting to eat in a healthier way, which is the typical entry point into clinical eating disorders, for many of them is very appropriate. But young people, just like they take dieting messages to extreme, similarly take these notions of what healthy eating is absolutely to extreme forms and find it very hard to understand what is appropriate and what is not. The importance of subclinical eating disorders is that we know there's very rapid movement in and out of mild, if you like, eating disorders. So when we look at epidemiological studies and study young people at six monthly intervals, as we've done at the Centre for Adolescent Health, the group of young people who have subclinical eating disorders at any six monthly interval is completely different uh, to the group that have them the next time. A lot of movement into clinical eating disorders. So if Dieting is so common. What's the sort of dieting that really concerns us? The dieting that is most worrying is dieting when it's associated with decreasing weight goals. So rather than deciding that I want to lose three kilograms and I'm going to be really happy and go out and celebrate that and let everyone I know know that I've been successful in losing weight, as is healthy weight loss, um, Dangerous dieting is when it's associated with ever decreasing weight goals, when it's associated with feeling worse about the body, when it's associated with greater self-criticism, and particularly in adolescents and women when it's associated with loss of menstruation. What are other, if you like, red flags for eating disorders? I've put up a list here, but particularly it's cooking for others but not eating oneself development of rituals or obsessions about particular food types, limiting the range of foods. Obviously concerns about uh, uh, large amounts of fluid or frequent visits to the bathroom, potentially signalling vomiting, uh, but becoming increasingly focused on body size and shape. To the point that when these behaviours become persistent and relentlessly pursued over time, it turns into then what we would then name clinically as an eating disorder. When it becomes a means of control, when it's associated with other comorbid issues like severe depression, when it becomes completely driven, relentless, uh, overwhelms anything else in a young person's life, that's when it becomes an eating disorder. The one that I'm talking primarily about today is of anorexia nervosa, which is historically defined in terms of being a dangerously low weight, but increasingly we're seeing a typical anorexia nervosa that I've got a few slides to follow on, where there's been significant loss of weight, but young people are not underweight at the time they present. Very difficult for GPs to diagnose. But anorexia nervosa, in addition to significant weight loss, is associated with the profound limiting of one's world gaze where everything becomes focused internally on body, on appearance, uh, and indeed uh, a world that shrinks from reality. Bulimia nervosa is interesting, and I'm uh, picking up on a couple of comments that, uh, that Christopher made. In the context of what I would refer to as the psychological notion of social contagion, which we have become aware is part of the phenomena of copycat suicide, for example. First described by a psychiatrist in 1974, copycat suicide is when particularly uh, a celebrity or someone who's very well known commits suicide and there's great discussion uh, and awareness in the media, followed by then an increased uh, increase in suicide by a similar means. But social contagion has been invoked for a wide range of other behaviours as well, and bulimia nervosa is one of those. Not previously described until about uh, the late 70s, early 80s, unlike anorexia, which has been around for centuries. It's believed that much of the, if you like, the social chatter uh, that's out there is one of the phenomena that persists in understanding from generation to generation now uh, about uh, how one can readily, easily lose weight. So let's think about young Sarah, standard patient that we would see in a clinical service. 14-year-old girl who was referred to the RCH specialist eating disorder program by a dietitian, 
previously well, Caucasian background, intact family, good student, small circle of friends, no major risk factors in her background, you might argue. Investigations by her GP were normal, which is to be expected. It is very unusual that any investigations that we do medically show any abnormalities. The investigations are basically to exclude anything else. They don't diagnose an eating disorder. And the GP only at the mother's insistence uh, referred this young lass off to a dietitian who rightly became much more concerned in taking a more detailed history and identified not just the extent of weight loss, which was nearly 10 kilograms in, as, in uh, nine months, but um, particularly demonstrated these growing, if you like, emotional consequences or sequelae of the eating disorder and the fact that this girl had uh, lost any menstrual cycles for the last five months. Now, typically, this girl was not herself concerned, thought her mum was completely overreacting. This is normal for an eating disorder. Unlike other conditions where people might be fearful of talking about them until others raise it, but then would often feel very relieved to be sharing the experience of, for example, suicidal ideation or depression or panic disorder with a parent, with a, a carer, with a health professional, with a teacher, for anorexia nervosa, it's what we describe as egocentonic. That is, it's embodied within the young person's sense of themselves, and they do not want help. We'll come back to that when we think about what's the responsibilities of schools and communities in terms of reacting. And on examination, when we finally saw this kid, she was profoundly unwell, with her pulse rate 40 lying, dropping to 26 per minute overnight, which is why we admit a kid like this to hospital in order to prevent death from cardiac arrhythmia. So here's a GP, and I'm not being judgmental about the GP. Many GPs miss the severity of eating disorders because we are not teaching this well enough in our universities and in our medical schools. But it is common the point I'm making is for GPs to be missing these conditions and therefore if people in families, schools and communities have concerns about eating disorders and uh, don't, I suppose, be falsely reassured by a GP saying everything is fine. So here's this kid who's lost weight uh, on the chart on the left um, and uh, his BMI has gone from normal to very abnormal on the right. What do we, oh, actually before I go on to what do we then do and how do we treat her, the point I raised before about this intersection of overweight and eating disorders and are these two sides of the same coin is that we've seen a five-fold increase in a very short time, just simply five years, of what we now call atypical anorexia nervosa. Exactly the same as anorexia in terms of all of the emotional disturbance and the thought patterns, except because these young people have started off at a higher weight, with the majority being in the overweight or obese category, some in the upper range of normal category, even though they've lost a lot more weight by the time they finally get to specialist services, they are not underweight. This is a newly described phenomena, and as I said, sadly, we're seeing a lot of it. So how common are anorex is anorexia nervosa? It's relatively still uncommon, and whilst the age group of presentation or the age at presentation is reducing so we're seeing many more 10 11 and 12 year olds now than we would ever have seen a decade ago it's still in a lifetime that one in a hundred women would have anorexia nervosa now arguably for such a severe mental disorder that's still relatively common in terms of eating disorders, they affect about uh, boys in about 10% of cases of anorexia nervosa, and we experience anorexia nervosa in all ethnicities and all socioeconomic groups. This is not a lifestyle choice. This is not simply seen in the sons of daughters of people who live in Malvern or Turak, with apologies to those of you who might live there. It is seen in the western suburbs as much as it's seen in Dandenong and in Turak. So how do we recognise it? It can be difficult. There is a continuum. Anorexia uh, hides itself. People who experience it uh, do not share it. But the importance for families and communities is that it's associated with a significant decrease in functioning at every level. Physical function, social function, and emotional functioning. 
Emotionally, these are the effects that are experienced within school communities of kids who are increasingly socially withdrawn, depressed, anxious, irritable, restless, poor concentration, increasingly rigid styles of thinking. Now, there are a whole lot of other mental disorders that can similarly have these associations. It's not unique to anorexia nervosa. The point being, however, that these symptoms need, or signs need to be taken seriously. One of the important elements is getting a diagnosis, and we'll come back to the roles of schools and communities in terms of that. But I just wanted to signal that one of the new treatments now available is family-based treatment for adolescents and children with anorexia nervosa. Things have completely changed since FBT became introduced in the majority now of Victorian eating disorder and CAMS services. So we introduced FBT as the first service in Victoria in 2008. So as I said, it's still relatively new. And we get a full recovery in anorexia nervosa when we use FBT, probably in about 50% of our patients. This is much, much uh, more reassuring than any of the data that we ever had before. Now, you can look at that, half full, half empty. We're still seeing a lot of people who don't fully recover. But boy, is this much better now than what we ever saw in the past. The importance of family-based treatment is that it requires engagement of both parents, if both parents are there, or the coming together in separated families of both parents, if kids are living and, and moving between households. And absolutely is recognising that rather than parents being ashamed because of being blamed for being the problem, as so often was the case in the past, that parents are critical to engage in terms of recovery. And the focus of family-based treatment is overwhelmingly to initially simply to do with weight restoration of returning kids to a healthy weight if they are underweight or stopping further weight loss for the atypical group who have lost so much weight. It involves very much the parents separating the disorder from the child and fighting anorexia nervosa. The point I want to make about these three phases is not to go into them in detail. Typically, FBT is about a six-month course of outpatient treatment that typically in our service follows um, uh, an inpatient stay which is required in about, about a third of our patients. But one of the important things with FBT is that for the first few weeks, potentially the first couple of months even, parents are, until they are confident that the young person is able to eat, will often have supervised eating even at school. And so the question there is where within a school community does that supervised eating take place? As I've mentioned, we've seen a dramatic shift in the way that parents are, I think, now more able to share a diagnosis, a professional diagnosis of an eating disorder with school-based and community-based professionals. There's been a dramatic difference and reduction in stigma. So a couple of uh, weeks ago in the Sunday age, one of our 12-year-old uh, patients and family was perfectly open to share what was a very recent story of complete recovery from anorexia nervosa in their son in a way that 10 years ago, most families would never go public in relation to, to coming, coming clean, if you like, in terms of having a diagnosis of anorexia. Even those school communities uh, typically would know that themselves. However, there is still a much greater stigma, I would argue, against anorexia nervosa than there is, for example, around depression or anxiety. I had a typical young person that I saw in my clinic on Monday afternoon who has both depression and anxiety and a relatively new onset diagnosis of anorexia nervosa wanted me to speak to the school to let them know the extent of depression and anxiety, but did not want me to share the details of the eating disorder. That at this stage, I've been happy to support Maybe if things don't continue along the positive direction that they're going at the moment, we might have to change our minds about that. So what to do if you suspect an eating disorder? I think the key thing is to be approaching young people with your concerns, to be notifying parents, and to persist if you persist in continuing to have concerns. As I've said earlier, don't be put off either by young people or parents telling you there isn't a problem, if particularly the school community believes there is. 
So, in greater detail, be prepared for a conversation. Expect denial, expect resistance. Garner your evidence. It's not just you as an individual teacher, but maybe it's a number of teachers, maybe it's a number of students who have shared their concerns with you in a school leadership role. Obviously, in terms of any conversation with a young person about a sensitive topic, choose your environment, a safe environment, choose your time. Think about language. I am concerned about you, I am worried about you, and others are too. Be respectful of where young people are at in a journey towards recovery. You might not know that they've been involved in seeing professionals for help for many years. You might know, that, or you might know, um, uh, but you can guess certain things. Schools have a lot of information about young people. So listen to what young people have to say very respectfully, but uh, if you have serious concerns, these concerns need to be shared with parents. It's a very different notion of confidentiality from certain other issues, and it's a, a hard balance to, to get right. What are the eating disorder services that we have in Victoria? Uh, our major hospitals, so the Children's Monash and the Austin, um, have specialist eating disorder services that are regionalised, so only see young people within their regions. There are private providers as well, but those that have very severe disorders are best managed in multidisciplinary teams. You may have heard of the Butterfly Day program, which is more typically uh, for young adults rather than for adolescents, given that family-based treatment is so more effective uh, than day programs. There are resources available. Uh, the Eating Disorder Foundation of Victoria has got a terrific website in terms of cheat sheets for what you might say uh, to family members or to loved ones if you're concerned about an eating disorder, and one can, in a sense, reframe that information uh, to conversations that might be having with, with others, whether they're work colleagues or in the community or in schools. A similar set of resources are uh, available through the National Eating Disorders um, Collaboration. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's lots of information out there. Uh, Eating Disorder Victoria has got a telephone hotline, very happy to talk to, um, uh, to school uh, professionals and any of the specialist eating disorder services uh, will also typically be very comfortable speaking with the nurse coordinators of the service uh, if you've got a concern that you don't seem to be able to persuade parents. So finally then, in drawing this to a close, how do we recognise that we have a huge burden of overweight and obesity, yet at the same time we have a growing burden of body image distress, poor self-esteem, and always we have lived with a proportion with disordered eating. It is a very hard space, in particular, for schools to be balancing uh, interventions one way or another and recognising that we have to be aware of both of these underweight and underweight problems and how mental health and wellbeing draws them together is critically important. I got a number of questions from you which were really trying to um, uh, help this balance of getting it right. And I don't have a single right answer for how to do it, I'm afraid, but the fact that you are in school communities thinking about these issues is the most important thing. What do I think are some of the simple things that can be done? I think that as leaders, as adults, as role models for young people, whether we're in schools or communities, we need to be very careful about our own language. I've been someone who typically, or for all my life, has been relatively slim, and heading now into my 50s and menopausal years of suddenly um, developing um, weight where I've never appreciated that uh, weight could be so readily put on. And I've realised that the language that I'm using about this at home has shifted. I've never previously talked about weight and body image, and I've had to, in a sense, intentionally stop myself from being as self-critical as I have, I have appreciated being publicly within my family. This is not helpful uh, for the kids that I live with at home. So school communities similarly need to be careful about the throwaway comments that as adults we just make all of the time about weight, about body image, about self-criticism. Focus much more on what bodies can do rather than what they look like. 
It sounds trite, but it's important. Bodies are not just um, separated from our brains. You know, we're not just walking brains on a body. Our bodies are amazing beings. Celebrate what our bodies can do. Encourage kids to be walking and riding to school. I know that parents are increasingly fearful of the violence rampantly that we have in our community. It's rubbish. We now are experiencing far lesser rates of violence, far fewer incidences of road traffic accidents than we ever have before. But the talk and the Twitter around that makes parents fearful of their kids actually having greater autonomy, which is important for their weight. Reinforce sporting participation. Prioritise fit ed within schools. Consider sports clothing and change rooms about the privacy and exposure of bodies in that environment. Be respectful of young people. Think about the range of sports on offer that might be appropriate both for the most underweight as well as those of a healthy weight. Avoid public weighing and BMI charting. It's too easy for everyone to get confused and develop unrealistic weight goals. I think it's a very dangerous thing to do in schools when it's done in things like uh, phys ed and health education classes. And like all schools should be targeting bullying, ensure that you are targeting weight-related bullying as part of that. What about the role of schools in terms of promoting healthy food? Remember that a third of kids arrive in your classrooms, for those of you who come from school communities, without having had breakfast. Breakfast is energy, or food, is energy for the brain. Kids will not be able to concentrate nearly as well without breakfast. I think the establishment of breakfast clubs for kids who just can't get their act together first thing in the morning, who come from families where they can't afford, afford food options, or just for kids who aren't interested at that time of day, is one of the most important things we can do that will both promote concentration in the first uh, few hours of the day, as well as promote healthier weight in terms of less um, uh, skipping of meals. I think that we also need to think about some of the more unrealistic approaches uh, and expectations. You've probably seen the Live Lighter campaigns that have been currently running through the Anti-Cancer Council that are very appropriate messages in terms of the toxic fat mass message for overweight adults in terms of them having risks of uh, cardiovascular incidences. But it's this sort of fear, if you like, that young people who don't have a more adult understanding and balance about what healthy eating and healthy diet and healthy physical activity is, that risk completely misinterpreting messages like this about the dangers of toxic fat, that if, no fat is, that if low fat is good, then no fat is even better. And as I said, for many of our patients, the majority of our patients with eating disorders, their entry point into disordered eating is through taking on the message that's very widely out there in the community about needing to eat in a more healthy way. That's a really important message, but like in everything in life, it's the balance of how that is implemented by young people and in terms of their knowledge and their ways about and then their knowledge of diets and health, um, they're not nearly as savvy as they might um, have you try it and believe. I just want to end, though, in terms of where Christopher Zinn took us at the start of the consumerism, because I feel really strongly that our politicians have failed to grasp the significance of consumerism and marketing to young people of food. The food industry is one of the biggest industries in the world. The extent that they are squealing internationally in those countries whose leadership has been bold enough to consider the notion of fat taxes in one way or other, whether it's Mayor Bloomberg in New York who tried to limit the size of sodas to, he didn't try to limit it to 100 mils or 200 mils, Mayor Bloomberg tried to limit the size of sodas to not having anything over half a litre now, these are extraordinary serving sizes that have become available. 
Mexico is the one country that has successfully introduced a fat tax. It's recognised that we need to be making unhealthy food options the more expensive choices for young people and obviously for families. And I think it's only when the community is recognising that individual efforts like Live Lighter campaigns are completely uh, tiny in terms of the sea of the multinationals who are selling and marketing unhealthy products to our kids. I would urge all of you to speak to your politicians, if you feel so inclined, to think about how we want to be protecting future generations rather than having them consumers of unhealthy food. Thank you.